Our second reading today is from Isaiah 44, verses 1 uh, to 8. Israel the chosen. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says, he who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will make the name Israel. This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> Before we go on, is that heating not working? Okay, John, just want to have a kick it on. I think it should be hotter than this in here. It's a 21 degrees is the temperature. If you kick it on for an override, that'd be great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would move among us by your spirit now. As the beginning, at the beginning of the year, Lord, uh, will we come to offer ourselves to you, Lord. We pray that you would move among us, that you would speak to us, you would bless us, you would empower us. Amen. In November, the church leadership went away for a day and we were considering the vision of the church for the coming year. It was about the time of year that farmers plough their fields in preparation for sowing the arable crops. And Steve, Steve Ailing, had a mental picture of a ploughed field prepared and ready for sowing. At the same time, I was given the scripture that we have just read and the scripture that you have on your um, bookmarks that I gave you. Yeah, now please don't leave them in the pew. This is, I think, important. It, you know, I think this is something God is saying to us as a church. It's this scripture. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. And this picture and this scripture led on to discussion between us as to how is Melbourne Baptist Church going to grow as part of God's church? And I'm going to speak, speak this morning on that question and what I believe God wants us 
to do and to know in the coming year. But before this, I just want to share what we as a leadership thought that God had showed us through the last two years of the COVID-19 epidemic. I think he showed us firstly that we can adapt and we can do things differently. And we've had to adapt to meeting together in different ways on Zoom, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, gathering online. Secondly, he showed us that God is our shepherd and he's kept us safe through that year or the two years from now. Thirdly, he showed us that the church is not the building, it's the people. He's added new people to us despite the restrictions and a few have drifted. But we have a supportive fellowship. You know, we have shown that we care for one another, I believe. We may have had our activities curtailed somewhat in the last two years, and we may have had to focus on holding on and holding together, um, but God has not stopped working. You know, God has not gone on furlough. Um, and now I believe that despite what may be the appearance, that we're in a time of growing and building. And I'm going to use the agricultural cycle and the scriptures to explore that. So the first thing I'm going to look at is plowing. Plowing is often a biblical metaphor for repentance. In Jeremiah chapter 4, it says, This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts. And Hosea 10 so righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Context of those scriptures was God speaking to his disobedient people, Israel and Judah, prior to them going into exile. And it calls for them to repent and avoid God's judgment. As Christians, we are always called to repent of our sins and turn to Christ, regularly, if not daily, throughout our Christian lives. But I don't think as a church, generally, you know, I'm talking NBC here, that we're in a time of judgment and repentance, but rather a, rather a time of sowing and growing. That brings us to sowing. After plowing comes sowing. But what is sowing in biblical terms? Firstly, as in the passages above, it's righteousness. We sow righteousness. Hosea 10, sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love. Proverbs 11, 18, a wicked person earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. That means, obviously, living according to the Ten Commandments and living according to Christ's interpretation of the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount and living according to the most important commandment, which is, as Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. If we live this way, we are sowing righteousness towards God. There's also a sense we are sowing these righteous acts towards others as well. We don't do the righteous things to impress other people. Jesus said, don't be like the Pharisees and make a display of your righteous acts. But rather, if we live the right way, the end result is that others will see our righteous acts and give glory to God. Matthew 5, Jesus says, Let your light shine towards others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. James says, Faith without works is dead faith. You know, we need to work out our faith and live righteously. Uh, Bless my heart the other day, I was talking to Jen, Jen Pritchard, 
and uh, asked you know, where she'd been, and she'd been delivering food parcels to those in need. She's part of a scheme that goes and delivers food to those people who need um, you know, food because of lack of income. Also, Jean and Sue Chapel and Janet, they, they're part of CAP and they go and you know, visit people who are in debt. Um, and I'm sure many other, others among you, you know, volunteer to help people in need. Well done, <laughs> carry on, you know, you're sowing righteous acts. I think secondly, what is sown is the word of God. Consider the parable of the sower. You now the farmer sows the word in Mark 4.20. You know, those like seed sown are like seed sown on good soil. They hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. The word of God is sown into our lives as believers. I trust that I've been sowing the word of God into your lives faithfully for the last five years. I hope and trust that it's bearing fruit in your lives. The word of God is sown into our lives and we read our Bibles daily. It will bear fruit when we receive it as the word of God, when we believe it as the word of God, and we act on it in faith as the word of God. You know, that's, that's what's meant by sowing the word of God into our lives. And we're also called to sow the word of God into the lives of others as well. We can encourage other believers with our words of encouragement, our testimony, our teaching. Now, we can send words of encouragement to people, you know, words of scripture in cards. You know, you can get cards from Littleton Well, you know. <laughs> They'll send you some nice cards with scriptures if you can't think of a scripture of your own. Um, we can, you know, we call to encourage one another with the word of God. We can share the word of the gospel into the lives of unbelievers. I remember years ago, um, Sue and I were, were part of a mission in Lincoln, um, where uh, as part of Youth for Christ, we went out into the... Uh, the parks of the town and the town centre giving out tracts and inviting young people to come to uh, a, a, an evangelistic meeting in the evening where an evangelist, J. John, was speaking. And um, as I was doing this in the afternoon, a homeless guy came up to me. Not to, he, he, was, he was quite old, actually, wasn't he, a young person. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm giving out invitations to a gospel meeting. He said, can I come? And I thought, yeah, OK, you can come. And he came along among all these young people. He was sat there at the back. And uh, halfway through, um, he said to me, can I go outside? I said, OK, um, I'll, I'll come with you. And, and as I was there, he, was, he went outside for a smoke. <laughs> but he said, you know, he said, this guy's speaking to me. And, and I started talking to him about Jesus. And the, one of the other evangelists came out, Steve Legg. And he started doing this. What's he doing? And I clocked, I clocked what he was doing. He was saying, keep sowing the word of God into this guy's life. He was just encouraging me to sow the word of God. And what encouraged me at the end of that meeting, loads of young people went up to, to be prayed for, to give their hearts to Jesus. And so did this homeless guy. You know, and I just hope and pray that, that he went on with the Lord. I was able to connect him with the homeless charity. And I don't know what happened in his life. But, you know, we, we're called to keep sowing the word of God into people's lives. Sometimes we sow for years and years and years. We don't see a lot of results, but we're still called to keep sowing the word of God. As Paul says in Colossians 4, devote yourselves to prayer. Pray for doors to be opened for the clear proclamation of the good news of Christ. Be wise in the ways you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And after sowing, there is watering. The motto, sex, the motto text says, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring 
and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. This is a reminder that we need more for a, gro for a growing church, both spiritually and numerically, than faithful preaching and Bible study and obedient living. We need that. Yeah, we need to be obedient. We need to study the Word of God. We need to listen to the, the Word of God preached powerfully. But we need more than that. We need the outpouring of the Spirit of God. In Scripture, the outpouring of water, the showers, the latter rains, they're metaphors for the outpouring of the Spirit of God. You can plow the fields and scatter uh, the good seed on the land, but if there's no soft, refreshing rain, the seed will lie dormant, or worse, it will just die in the parched soil. We need the Spirit of God to be poured out onto our church. We need the Spirit of God to be poured out onto God's church for growth to take place. As Paul says, as he was speaking to the Corinthian church plant in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. See, only God can make a church grow. Only God can make a Christian grow by the operation of his life-giving Holy Spirit. See, the outpouring of this Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit water, is a sign of the coming of the Messiah and the Messianic age. In Joel chapter 2, in the day of the Lord, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. And in chapter 3 of Joel, it says, all the ravines of Judah will run with water, a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. You know, this was a scripture quoted by Peter at Pentecost as being fulfilled at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, we must continue to pray fervently that God will pour out his Holy Spirit on us, that we might do the things that Jesus and his disciples did. We need to be expectant that he will move in our services, our prayer meetings, our everyday lives, and that he'll be glorified in his church today. We need the Spirit of God in our lives. We need God to move in power in our lives. I think that's the only thing that will make a difference to us as a church this year. We can do lots of things. I remember reading a, a reading by Tozer, and he says that in many, many, many churches, in many, many lives of Christians, the church of God continues week after week without the Spirit of God. Services are prepared, hymns are sung, sermons are preached, cups of tea are served, um, and life goes on. But without the Spirit of God, there's nothing. Yeah, we can, we can do our religious duty, but actually without the Spirit of God to change us, to move us, to energize us, you know, we... We're wasting our time. We need the Spirit of God to move. And I believe God wants to pour out His Spirit on us. Just prior to Christmas, we met in the small lands next door, and um, we were waiting on God. And at one moment in that meeting, we heard the wind rushing around the building. Great big gust of wind. Um, and the door started banging. And... I could feel the Spirit of God <laughs> come through me, and so could others. God was, I think God was saying to us, you know, we need the Spirit of God. I want to pour out my Spirit on you as a church. And that's, that's my text this morning. That, you know, I'd like you to take your little plastic um, uh, bookmark, put it in your Bible, and pray for the Spirit of God to move each day as you read your Bibles. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Holy Spirit, come into our church and move among us today. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you for your works. Thank you, Lord, that it is sown into our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we can read it uh, regularly, daily. We're free to do that. But, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would send your spirit and water that word, that it might grow and bear fruit in our lives, fruit in your church here and in the people we live among. Amen. We're now going to uh, have our Act of Covenant Renewal, the first service of the year. We say of Act of Dedication. Um, so I'll ask you to stand, please. Let's say this together. Heavenly Father, we are honoured to belong to this congregation and accept our responsibility to serve Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. We acknowledge Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord and depend upon the Holy Spirit's aid day by day. On this first Sunday of the new year, we promise, with God's help, to lead lives that honour Christ. We accept the spirit of prayer and Bible study and will endeavour to lead other people to know Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves to the service of God in this church and in our wider community to use our gifts faithfully and generously in the building of the people of God and in the advancement of God's kingdom here in Malvern. We thank God for our sisters and brothers who belong to the other churches of our town. We promise to pray for our church and all churches that our work and witness will be carried out in the power of the Spirit to the glory of Christ and the honour of the Father. Amen. Amen.